seems to be promised for a long time and we keep hearing about it at different venues as coming along. In fact, this flyer I picked up in uh, Friedrichshafen in 2015 and it was uh, promising it in the first quarter of 2017. Well, <coughs> all I can say is, um, frankly, uh, the last I've heard is that we may be lucky if we get it in the first quarter of 2018. Um, I work in the satellite industry, I keep in touch with different projects, I mean, this is one that I could be working on myself perhaps, um, if you want to go to Japan, but uh, it's being put together by Mitsubishi Electric. Um, and the last I heard was that um, in September, which is obviously now, uh, there's going to be a flurry of activity which to me means that it's going through the last stages of environmental testing as a, an integrated satellite. What you're seeing in this picture here is a very early stage of the satellite um, construction. If I can just make it any bigger, could you make the picture a bit yeah, bigger yeah. for me? Um, because the satellite is actually constructed in two parts. It's constructed as what we call the bus, which is the mechanical part comprising of the engines, electrical system, uh, so forth, and the payload. And at some point, these two parts are put together. We call it mating. And this looks like a picture not long after mating. So this would have been in uh, about 2016, uh, sorry, 2000, end of 2015. And in this picture here, you can see various elements which are of interest to me. You can see lots of pieces of wire coiled up there. That's because they're still finishing off the integration. Uh, the silvery bits down the side are radi radiation called travelling wave tubes. They still use travelling wave tubes in space. That's the standard. Um, give you about 100 watts output, basically. And they've got a, a, a fin on the end, just like a motorcycle cooling head that radiates the space. Um, you've got two silver tanks underneath. Those things are <coughs> probably containing helium, which they use to propel the gases that uh, operate the rocket engines on there when it's being put into place. Up the top on the right-hand side, you can see a star tracker, and you can see one on the other side, obviously duplicated in all cases. Um, they're used to keep the satellite pointing correctly, and you can do this to within about 10 milli degrees. They're very accurate indeed. Anyway, normally the, the top shelf, that's a bit at the top, is the bit that's facing the Earth. Um, what's obviously missing <coughs> is this side and probably the other side, you'll have deployable antenna arrays. Obviously there's nothing there right now. And on the sides going through the picture, you will have the solar arrays, which are usually, I mean the satellite will be orientated north-south. So this is quite an early on integration picture. Obviously there's a lot of work uh, required to make a satellite and normally from signing the contract to getting one into orbit and hand it over is about 30 months, two and a half years. Um, if it's a special, it takes longer. If you have problems, and sometimes undergoing tests, tests are done to identify problems, things come up and you have to change bits of equipment. If a piece of equipment comes out of the centre of that satellite, it will take six months to turn around and get back in again, and then you start the test cycle again. So, from my viewpoint, um, <coughs> as I say, finger on the pulse of possible work, um, that uh, their activity is stepping up in, Octo in September, which says to me that the environmental testing phase is probably ongoing and, and finishing. And uh, after that, we have um, various tests. For example, you will test the antenna radiation patterns in the special uh, antenna test field called a KTAR range. Then the whole lot is shipped off to the launch site. In this case, it's being launched by a Falcon 9 rocket, according to what I've got on the web, but there's nothing on the schedule yet. Um, it spends about six weeks on the launch site, being prepared for launch, doing various last-minute tests and fueling the satellite. Uh, a very critical phase, of course, because they have to look for leaks and all sorts of stuff like that. Then they stick it on top of the rocket. It's launched, in my opinion, if everything goes smoothly it's quite possible that this could launch in the first quarter, probably March next year. After it's launched, you then spend a period of time with in-orbit testing, and in this case, I would suggest it's probably going to take about two months. You have various meetings and so on to decide it's up to scratch and so on, and, and there you go. So I would think that you're probably looking at May before it's available. Um, <coughs> of course, satellites are launched for a business case, to make money. They don't launch them as a, a toy. The amateur radio aspect is a, effectively a, an experiment on board. It will use um, a spare transponder or a spare <coughs> TWT amplifier. Um, obviously, if during the course of the satellite's life, 
one of the, what I say is normal working channels was to fail, then they would call upon that spare. So it doesn't mean to say it's available for the lifetime of the satellite. The satellite itself is built to last a minimum 15 years. They usually go on for 17 or 18 years and uh, usually you have to eject them from orbit once they run out of rocket fuel and that's as simple as that because you can't keep them in a position. Although these days satellites are becoming more <coughs> electrically operated, they use HEP thrusters. So on board um, you have xenon gas, xenon gas is far more efficient than the old uh, propulsion system mixing two gases together to make a, a bang. But all the same, that will run out after a while. So hopefully we'll get it, I reckon, uh, launch March if we're lucky. Somebody raised a very valid point earlier, <laughs> which I totally agree. Um, if the business case for the satellite which should disappear, they might just put it on hold. And on hold, you know, I've seen an Intelsat sitting in the corner of a certain place in Portsmouth, which some of you may be familiar with, and that had been there for years because the business case for that satellite had disappeared. So anyway, um, SHL-1 was launched a number of years ago. This is SHL-2. It doesn't mean to say they've had a lot of satellites, so maybe there's something special about this one. Um, I believe the customer principally is the Qatari government. Draw from that what you like. Um, so, you know, it may, that may be why it's taking longer than normal to actually make. But with a bit of luck, 2018, we could see it launched. And uh, I think um, one of the other technical aspects was raised. I think Dave mentioned it, other mentioned it. If, you're, if you've got a number of wideband, you know, 2 megahertz wide or whatever, 4 megahertz wide uplink signals, maybe carrying TV on the same transponder, it'd be interesting to see how our current receivers handle that. Um, personally, uh, one of the solutions that I would use would be a, a, a pre-selector based upon a saw filter. So I would tune it effectively to any channel that I wanted. I could even make it variable, that's as simple as that. So you, you'd have a pre-selector filter. And then you'd only have one channel at a time presented to the actual tuner tune receiver. But if it sees eight, interesting. We need to do some tests. Anyway, over to you then, Dave. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I'd like to thank Jeff for uh, stepping in at short notice with, the, with that information. Um, I'll... Luckily, he's stolen much of my thunder. I will just uh, pull up my presentation which, and talk about the equipment we need to use uh, with it. Uh, no, wrong one. Other Cat17 folder. There we go. Oh, that one. Right. Okay, um, the amateur radio aspects, Qatar aren't strong on amateur radio, and they've asked primarily the German AMSAT organisation for assistance in it. So AMSAT DL are actually leading on all the ground station and planning for this. Uh, Noel and I went to a meeting with them uh, in January and have a fairly good handle on what's, what's going on from their perspective. Um, and there are uh, monthly uh, Skype calls we have with them. Um, so coverage, it's good for us, not for the USA. Um, that's our part of the payload with two twits for us, um, two S-band receivers. Um, we're interested in the wideband transponder. There's a narrowband transponder where they're all going to do uh, SSB and banging two bits of metal together. And there's a, a wideband transponder which is 8 megs wide. The uplink for the wideband is 2401.5 to 2409.5. Right hand circular polarisation. Downlink for the wideband is 10491 to 10499. So unmodified universal LMB, octagon LMB will come out it's about 690. 690 somewhere around there. The narrowband segment is below 
and those are differently polarized. Uh, the wide band is horizontal, the narrow band is vertical. Okay. AMSAT DL came to us for some help on the digital ATV side. Um, they're, they're doing an awful lot of work on the narrow band side and e to the extent that they will even identify stations who are transmitting with too much power and they will put a warning signal on top of them to warn them that they're having, putting up too much power. Um, but they came to us to look at the DATV experience. Um, and we went back to them and said, well, look, we've got all these modes that we can run. We need to have some rules. Um, and we've got some challenges with the link budget. You know, you are going to need quite a lot of power to get up to this thing to get the signal back down. But we can help ourselves in this by using modes that need a lower carrier to noise. So we're looking at DVBS2 QPSK where you need less power to get the same amount of video quality back. Their initial proposals were talking about using 8PSK somewhere up around here for all the beacons and the like. And we said, no, hang on a minute. Let's go narrow and better modes to start with. We can experiment later. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't transmit two mega symbols DVBS up to the thing. Um, but really we want to experiment, see what we can do better. In the same way as we've done on 146 with 333. You know, in the 333 killer symbols we can do HD using DVBS 2. So let's try things like that. The problem is, we've got this big transponder and it's going to be the Wild West. Even if amateurs only use it properly, we are going to have lots of different modes and different bandwidths up there and nobody's going to know what's there. I won't even go into improper use, um, but that I think will be an issue. <coughs> so the BATC contribution is going to be to provide a, a web-based spectrum monitor. So we have a web page on the internet with 8 megs of bandwidth displayed and a chat window so people can say what's the signal on 10494? I can't decode it. And somebody would come up and say, oh it's experimental DVB S2X or something or it's Joe Bloggs, the feed from his truck, it's DVBS, one mega symbol. Yeah. So we can have this coordination so it's not a black hole for people. Receiving it should be fairly easy with an 80, centi 80 centimetre dish. Um, PLL and B's will work well. And you come out at, sorry, it was 741 megs. I didn't get my sums right earlier. Come out at 741 megs, which for a, either a sharp tuner or a serrate tuner will work well. Um, you can also, if you want to use a normal satellite receiver, use a Bob Platts type LMB down at 9 gigs. You'll need to watch stability, perhaps a phase locked Bob Platts or something like that. And there is the option of changing the crystal in the octagon down to Absolutely. So, that works. so, you, about one gigs. so you can move the, the local oscillator in the octagon P, PLL LMB. Um, you can use a mini tuner. Or you can up-convert. You could use something like an SGP2400. Um, G0MRF of AMSAT UK has done a very nice design for a converter. It's intended to go down, but you can, with the LO you can also go upwards. AMSAT DL, though, have just come up with a design for what I think is going to be a very good converter. Um, and they're looking to market this at around the 130 to 150 euro ready built for the satellite for the amateur satellite market assuming they get the right uh, quantity of uh, bidders but that will have two outputs one at 145 megs for the narrow band transponder and one at 1339 for the wide band transponder 
Um, this is about all the information there is of, of it at the moment. It's being presented at the AMSAT DL convention at Wienheim this weekend. Right, OK. Yeah, I think it will. Yeah, in fact, Akim, the guy who designed it, is coming to that. I'm not sure whether he's lecturing. Uh, uplink, close to Wi-Fi. This will cause issues. Uh, my house is already on five gigs. There's a more important reason than that as well. They may well use the 2.4 gig uplink band for the TMTC for the satellite. Uh, no, it's down at two. It's, it's, it's two gigahertz. Yeah, it's lower. Yeah. yeah. 2, 1 .8 to 2 .2. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's the same band, so you know. We're on yeah. the edge of the edge yeah. of the coverage of the helix, which is why. Make sure you <laughs> don't have any spurious coming out of your output. That's important. Be clean. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, we need to be clean on the uplink. Um, spectral regrowth is going to be an issue there, especially looking at the power levels we're going to want to have. Um, Two ways of generating this. You can either up convert, we were talking about this earlier, do you up convert from 437 up to 2400? Um, using a narrowband converter, uh, Kuna do a, Euro, a 500 euro converter, or do you generate at 2400? DATV Express will, ports down will give about a milliwatt. Uh, DTX1, there is talk of some modifications to a DTX1 to make it do it. Pluto will definitely do it, but again, low power. Need to amplify it up. Yeah. These. We wrote this slide way before. <laughs> yeah, we did. No, I modified some of them, but yeah. Um, this is the sort of uplink budget. Remember, if you're running less bandwidth, sorry, a smaller bandwidth, you need less power. I'll let you read that. I'm certainly going to be starting on 333 kilo symbols. And we'll see what we can achieve after that. I haven't got a 2.4 metre garden, let alone a 2.4 metre dish. So, fantastic opportunity for experimentation. A, an opportunity to learn more about another part of the hobby. Um, we're going to need to capitalise on it. Limited time, I think. Um, good coordination we're going to need to do. But start simple. Get a, receive, get a receiver working. See what's up there. And plan ahead to get some transmit capability. <laughs>